Hello, AP World History students. So here we got a flipped uh, video lesson here, and our topic is the, the Ottoman Empire. And we have another place, sort of like China or Russia, uh, in crisis uh, here in uh, the period from 1750 to 1900. And, and so we want to talk about how do we take this mighty gunpowder empire, the sort of uh, maybe perhaps the peak, you know, of the, of the Islamic world, um, the largest political state in the Islamic world that had been so powerful, and how does it sort of end up in a kind of a decrepit position by the end of this period of time. So that's our story. Uh, let's just jump right in. Um, the, the 19th century is, um, you know, is a period of crisis uh, as they're responding to the rise of the industrialized nations. And sort of like Russia and perhaps like China, uh, the steps here are very difficult. And the dynamic is there are people within the Ottoman world who are reformers, who want to uh, modernize, who want to find ways to authentically merge Islamic culture with, uh, with the sort of industrial prowess and modernity of Great Britain and France and the United States. And then there are reactionaries, right? There are people who, who sort of uh, only look to the past for solutions and sort of look somewhat rigidly and in a sort of a, an overly prescriptive or black and white sense to the past, uh, these reactionary forces. And, in, in, and here in the Ottoman Empire, they're going to be pointing to Islam, uh, sort of Muslim scholars, and the Janissary Corps is another issue there. So, uh, and we'll, we'll note here that like this stagnancy that it's experiencing, the fact that it had become kind of so calcified and so slow is not something that had newly popped up. It was sort of a it was kind of a slow growing cancer in its cultural and economic system. That's so let's back up for just a second and just sort of explain the stagnancy that, you know, when we enter into 1750, like why the Ottoman Empire was in a poor position already to respond to to the rise of the industrial West. First thing we'd point to, just thinking back to the previous uh, period of time, um, uh, you know, uh, 1450 to 1750, the Islamic world had sort of geographically lost out. Again, picture, you know, where the Islamic world was relative to the Indian Ocean trade network and that Indian Ocean basin. They had a, they had a beautiful economic position and anything that Europe wanted, um, uh, the Islamic world and the, the Ottomans in particular could be that kind of gateway. Uh, they, could, they could provide that for them. Europe... Uh, finding an end around and then cashing in in the Americas um, meant that the, the, the Ottoman Empire and many, many of the gunpowder empires were sort of like now on the defensive, all right? And, and these young and vibrant uh, states or even entities like the British East India Company could now start chipping away at the territorial holdings. And you did that, remember that DBQ where we're, we're seeing all these sort of Muslim rulers and Muslim states saying, hey, we got to do something about these Portuguese showing up here and chipping away and taking the stuff from us. This is, this is what was going on in that period of time. And so expansion, Islamic expansion had stopped. Their share in world trade was shrinking rather than growing. But they were still spending, you know, like you can see palaces, Ottoman palaces like this are no joke. And so they're still spending like a civilization kind of at its peak. But uh, that spending, you know, wasn't keeping up. The revenues weren't keeping up with spending. And, um, you know, when that happens, you, you end up overtaxing and then people end up bribing to get out of the overtaxation or using extortion tactics to get those taxes. And these are all dysfunctional economic practices that have long-term negative economic effects, and that's all starting to take place. And that's a lot of that is below the surface, or things on the surface still look fine, but below the surface, things are, are troubling, economically speaking. Culturally, it's a similar thing. It's a sad thing because we know, you know, in period one, which is 1200 to 1450, you're talking culture, we're talking the Islamic world. I mean, that's where the scientific ideas are coming out of, that's where the agricultural stuff, that's where the artistic stuff is. But by the 16th and 17th century, that edge is just slipping. And it's, a ch it's difficult to explain exactly what happened, but I think if we're just gonna summarize, we'll say that like within the Islamic world, it just came to be seen that the only worthwhile intellectual endeavor is to study the Holy Scripture, to study the Quran, right? Um, and, and the study of the Quran, which even that, which had once upon a time been sort of like um, 
it had been done through kind of question and debate, it was increasingly seen as sort of uh, rote memorization, almost along the line of what, what like the Confucian mandarins had always been doing. And so, and that's not necessarily great for critical, creative, innovative thinking, right? And so you sort of, thinking got sort of calcified along these sort of the lines of the olds and new ideas that didn't fit with it were like thrown out, right? Uh, you know, or just disregarded as like inconsequential compared to the, the holy word of God as sort of spoken by, by Muhammad, right? And so increasingly there's fewer and fewer and fewer non-religious books being published in Arabic. You know, being printed is an interesting thing. Like even the printing press was sort of something that was only allowed for government use in the Islamic world. And what they were, what the government was authorizing the printing of was religious texts. Um, there's, there's virtually, by the, by the 17th century and 18th century, there's virtually no um, uh, texts in Arabic, in the, in the Ottoman Empire, about foreign ideas or about like how to how to understand foreign languages it's just sort of like little bit by little bit the gaze turns inward or it's like navel gazing staring at your own cultural or religious belly button rather than at the world around you right and so this these older traditions of like supple and adaptive free thinking and inquiry or even challenging inquiry about religion itself gets sort of debated or get replaced with just sort of like rigid, um, rigid memorization of the Quran. Uh, a, a, an aphorism or a saying from this period that you can spot its dysfunction. May God protect us from useless knowledge, right? So this lack of curiosity about non-religious questions is a problem. And of course, I would just say in a kingdom sense, you know, they're all religious questions, you know, like it's, it's all, it's all the study of God's creation, but sort of that, that, that sense of that, uh, that mystery was lost. And so it's like, no, no, we just study the scripture and study of worldly things is something that's, that's a, a waste of time. Okay. So that's kind of a backstory. By the time we get into the 1800s, we're look, we're seeing a, a collapse in place and it's a slow collapse, but it, it's definitely happening, right? Uh, t uh territory is, is being lost um, in the Middle East on the on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, uh, an Islamic uh, fundamentalist uh, family called the Saud family sort of gains control of much of the Arabian Peninsula, including Mecca, from the Ottoman Empire. And so the Ottomans kind of lose control of the of the, the the homeland, right? The home territory of Islam from back in the day, um, up in up in Europe. In Southeast Europe, I should say, like what is today the Gre Greece and the Balkans, uh, little piece by little piece is getting, they're losing control of those. Um, uh, and this is like, as those places are sort of agitating for nationalist control of themselves, or sometimes there's, uh, there's religious tensions there, as those places were oftentimes Christian, they're losing control there. Now we recall that the Western powers, Britain and France, while they didn't fully respect uh, the Ottoman Empire, they recognized that the Ottoman Empire was playing a useful function in Southeast Europe and kind of keeping contained some of the chaotic forces that we're going to see unleashed there when we get to World War I or thereabouts. And so Britain and France sort of didn't mind the Ottoman Empire being there and sitting on the Middle East and sitting on Southeast Europe. Uh, and, and the Eastern question, as it was called, was just the question of, like the Ottoman Empire is is in the process of falling down the stairs, let's say. How can we help them to slowly do it and how can we kind of escort them into infirmity <laughs> in a way that is least chaotic and most protective of our own interests? Uh, and so that's why, for example, when Russia uh, invades uh, tries to grab territory in the Crimean when in that Crimean War. That's why Britain and France jump in to protect the Ottoman Empire because they're saying, hold on, hold on, hold on. We don't want things to destabilize too quickly and lose control of this. The Ottomans also face this. So in addition to losing territory and being treated with pats on the head by foreign powers, um, the Ottomans are subjected to what are called these capitulations, which just means that like, uh, and China had to face this too. The capitulations are like, uh, outside powers like bankers or traders, merchants uh, from Britain, from France, uh, are not subject to Ottoman law, right? So like basically our people, the Western powers are saying, our people 
don't need to listen to you or your laws. Like while they're in your country, they're subject to our laws. And if you ever accuse them of doing something wrong, we'll take care of that. We're not going to have you take care of that. And uh, if you don't like it, well, what are you going to do about it? And so these are sort of, these are, these are seen as diplomatic humiliations that, that people from these Western powers weren't even really subject to Ottoman law. So what are they going to do? Right? Uh, what, what do we do about this? How do we respond? Um, again, there's these different forces. There's, there's uh, reforming forces and reactionary forces. Uh, the loudest and most dangerous of the reactionary forces were the Janissary Corps, right? And we remember who the Janissary were. They were kind of collected from Christian families in Southeast Europe, uh, you know, indoctrinated uh, into uh, Islam and the Arabian language and uh, brought up to be high-level bureaucrats and, and warriors, the elite warriors, loyal only to the Sultan and the Ottoman system. Um, but by, by the early 1800s, the Janissary are very difficult because they are, they are so reactionary that they're kind of opposed to a lot of these reform efforts, and they're kind of handcuffing or limiting the ability of Sultans to, to do the things they might want to do. And, and they're kind of a, an interesting force in and of itself. And so uh, Sultan Mahmoud II um, massacres the Janissary Corps, just kills them all. And that's the end of that, uh, that tradition. Uh, and that's a strange end, but I think he's recognizing that like, this is, this is a, this, it had become a destabilizing force in the Ottoman system rather than a stabilizing force. Uh, and they were resisting modernization. The Ottomans try, sort of like Russia or China, these kind of halting efforts, these semi-efforts at modernization that never are really quite enough. The Tanzimat reforms are, are the specific example, if you want a piece of evidence here, um, you know, where they are, they're trying to westernize aspects of their military or westernize aspects of their schools, um, moving away from Sharia law and toward secular law. Uh, so as they're trying to put these changes in place, uh, it's fair to say that that uh, religious leaders or religious uh, clerics were were noisy. They were loud. They were pushing back against this. Not everyone is loving this. These changes are difficult, and so catching up is just it's it's not agreed within the Ottoman system what the right response should be. And a lot of them accused Ottoman sultans of of just you know essentially betraying their cultural heritage and their their legacy. Um, in terms of the voices for reform, there's a group called the Young Ottomans. And I just want to say something real quickly because later in this slide I talk about the Young Turks. Technically, the Young Ottomans are different than the Young Turks. They are both reform movements that are sort of interested in kind of westernizing, secularizing somewhat um, their system while also maintaining uh, some essential Islamic nature. Um, but they're, they're basically forces for reform. But the young Ottomans are sort of a generation or two before the, a generation or so before the young Turks. But they're similar, and I think if you get them mixed up, it's really not the end of the world because they're, they're doing about the same thing. So anyway, uh, the young Ottomans are, are, are pushing for this modernization. And there is an interesting moment in, in 1876 where, where they uh, stage a coup and put in place, they're going to set up a representational government and there's a new constitutional system. And hey, look at us, looky here, like the Ottoman Empire is going through dramatic uh, political reform. And the Sultan, sort of like what happened with Tsar Nicholas, the Sultan kind of puts up with this, kind of goes along with this for a bit, and then just says, you know what, that's, we're not going to mess with this stuff, and dismisses the, the, new, uh, the new legislature and goes back to absolute, uh, absolute rule. And so it's kind of this fitful efforts toward it that just are, are just hard, right? It's just not smooth and not easy. And so the young Ottomans, now that their, their system has been expelled or their system has been dismissed by the Sultan, they go into exile in Paris. Uh, and they continue to sort of press for modernization efforts and they continue to write and they're trying to influence from the outside. And there would be some, there would be a new wave. These young Turks would come in in, in 1908. But really by this point, by the turn of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire is in, it's weakened, it's very weakened. It's in its, I guess you could say, death throes. Uh, the end will come with World War I and we will get to that. But it's just safe to say that these reforms never happened fully enough and they weren't deep enough and and the the end was a long time coming so i think if you can just imagine a, an leq prompt for yourself to compare and contrast 
reform efforts between Russia and the Ottoman Empire, two places that kind of had a similar story here in the 19th century. What was similar? What was different? What do you see? Anyway, that's it. Good work today, guys. Take care.